welcome to this webinar hosted by Forbes Middle East in partnership with GPM. Today, we're discussing the future of financial services, specifically the path ahead. We are going to shed light basically on the services that are being um, uh, provided by the financial sector at a time that a lot of experts like to describe as the digital boom. Banks are now planning to utilize hybrid cloud data, fintech, and AI in order not only to deliver value to their existing customers, but to also attract, uh, to, to maintain those customers and attract new ones and specifically to uh, compete. There's a fierce competition in the financial and many other sec sectors now in this digital uh, age. We've got an amazing panel of industry uh, experts. So we're going to detail with them this digital boom, how it's been a game changer uh, in the financial sector and how the banks are dealing with it to basically offer unparalleled services uh, to their uh, customers and of course maintain the competition. I'm going to briefly um, introduce our experts and get straight to the point. It's a, it's a difficult topic to some, but it actually affects every single other sector outside of uh, banking. I welcome Sanjay Khanna, CIO of Rack Bank, uh, Rajesh Nakbal, who's the Director, Banking and Finance at yep. GBM. Mustafa Zafar is the Vice President, Hybrid Cloud um, and AI, uh, Middle East and Africa at IBM. Mark Diamond is the Group Chief Operations and Technology Officer at Network International, and Bart Petrushka, Chief Data and Analytics Officer at HSBC. Welcome to all of you. I hope we're all gonna mix and match your expertise and benefit from each other so you can enlighten those uh, viewers who are not financial experts like uh, myself. So Sanjay, allow me to start with you. You've amassed uh, a long experience in the financial sector and specifically in information uh, technology. And you maybe more than anyone right now are very aware of how technology is changing the banking uh, landscape and the services around it. Can you tell us more how is Rackback, Rackbank providing new and, and improved services in this digital uh, age? And what are your plans maybe to further digitize additional services? As you see, technology, especially in the last two decades, if you say more so in the last two decades, since the advent of the internet uh, boom, as now the mobile boom, as they call it, or the digital boom, whatever the people need to name it, technology has been changing the uh, way humans behave with the, and interact with the various uh, touch points that they have with the banks. As I say, you started with ATMs, then you went into internet banking, today you are all into the mobile age. From the uh, Rag Bank perspective, uh, we have been leading, we have been at the forefront of this development for almost 10 years now. Uh, we have been delivering uh, solutions to the customers on, around these platforms uh, for a very long time and we continue doing so. Especially as the uh, uh, demand from the customer and uh, with the advent of the COVID more so, uh, customers are looking at avenues where you can do onboarding very efficiently through uh, an online channel, whether it's a, your desktop or your through a mobile channel, do you want to do an online? Uh, that is the first touch point of the customer, besides the doing the regular transactions, which the uh, customer wants to do. So in the last few years, we have relaunched and repackaged our uh, complete digital platform over there. We have launched... Uh, our credit card onboarding is completely now uh, digitalized and people can apply it on the website. Going forward also, we are looking at integrating and making the journey much more uh, simpler for the uh, customers. Getting, uh, basically using more AI over there, integrating with the government services like UAE Pass and all to authenticate and make the customer journey much more uh, smoother and also basically using uh, some of the blockchain platforms. I don't know whether you might have heard uh, Rag Bangers already. It was in the news some time back. We were tied up with uh, Dubai Economic Department and Norblock is uh, as one of the partners where onboarding of the SME clients, their trade license and all, we will be able to do it very smoothly through using this blockchain platform. 
I suppose we're going to hear a lot about more uh, banks using uh, more AI, integrating smoother experience. I'm going to take that to Rajesh, if you don't mind. Uh, GPM, where you've been now for years, since 2003, has been uh, offering or simplifying uh, these target goals to uh, banks, such as what Sanjay has uh, discussed. So you've, you're sort of a technological transformation player uh, in the region. How have you provided the right tools and resources for banks to embrace uh, digitization in their services? Well, financial services is anyway going through a, a different transition. I think something that started with digitizing a process, move forward to a larger agenda of digital transformation, where the business started looking at the larger business aspect that delivers a customer experience. Now, coming back to what Sanjay Point was saying, while the pandemic is unprecedented, for sure the disruption has been normal and disruption has been there for the last two decades. What we see in the market is declining revenues and uncertainties. We see challenging and demanding customers in terms of the digital native customers. We see some of the emergence of new business model, rise of the fintech, the big tech, and also the open banking thrust by the central bank. And also we see a lot of regulatory pressure coming both in terms of the compliance and the resiliency of the business operation. As I think the world will emerge from the, com the COVID-19, the pandemic, and with the rise of AI, automation, IoT, 5G, blockchain, I believe digital reinvention has become quite a necessity for every organization to create a strategic advantage to succeed. At the same time, the business also may might sure make sure that the resiliency is in place. So you need to have a striking balance between digital reinvention and the resiliency piece. Banks are investing billions of dollars to make sure basically they get their act in place because they're being challenged by the FinTech and the new digital only banks. We are engaged with our clients, both in terms of on the digital reinvention and digital resiliency agenda. Four key areas where we're helping customers is around migrate and modernize in terms of moving these customers towards a hybrid cloud deployment, helping them with journey to cloud consulting, identify what are the potential application that we could either lift, shift, modernize, refactor, or maybe help them in terms of picking up the SaaS applications, migrate and deploy these applications to the cloud and make sure we still maintain a robust security posture. Second area where we're working with them is around accelerated digital agility. We are using design thinking to move faster and to deliver human-centric outcomes. We're leveraging IBM capabilities in the region. We are also providing some of the leading platforms around the automation of the campaigns, major campaigns uh, across multiple digital channels, help marketers understand the effectiveness of the campaign and also understand which channel is the most preferred channel by the customer. Every day, business has mandate tasks to do, which can be automated with support of uh, technologies like RPA, AI, so that the customer can focus on a larger uh, a part of uh, the value. We are helping customers around process mining and automation. Third dimension where we are supporting this customer is around innovation in terms of experimentation, how we, we are able to understand the customer risk preferences and aversions because everybody is looking at uh, a very intuitive interface and hyper-personalized, while the banks have uh, not been able to cope up with these traditional integration approaches. And, and that's where I think there's a larger need of the flexibility. And uh, that's where we are helping customer understand more agile model of uh, development, integration, microservices, okay. help them on the architecture piece. Yes, uh, allow me please just to interject here to take this to Mustafa because now we heard, uh, yeah, if we heard from the bank's perspective from uh, Sanjay and GBM's perspective as a provider or facilitator, let's say, of these services. I'd like to hear more specifics from you, uh, Mustafa. Uh, you've been with I IBM also for quite some time now dealing with hybrid cloud and data security and AI solutions. Now you're at the focus, at the crux of the need uh, maybe of these services. What? essential elements do you think banks should be taking into consideration when they're looking to adopt any uh, hybrid cloud solution, data and fintech as well as AI to improve and upgrade the services just like we just heard from Sandra. I just a touch point on very important things and very important drivers and changes that's happening in the market, <clears throat> especially after the pandemic. And we all know what happened after the pandemic, uh, but let me try to summarize what we see the elements of 
how to adopt an like um, an AI or a hybrid cloud or a fintech uh, in a in the financial services institutions. One which is extremely important, I think Sanjay hinted on it a lot, is is the customer expectation. Customer expectation and experience is becoming a major demand. I personally move from one bank to the other because I was expecting more from my bank in terms of services, in terms of understanding my needs, and that needs a lot of data. Uh, you, you would be a very tough customer for any bank, by the way. I, 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 I was with my bank, honestly. <laughs> and, and when I moved to the other bank, um, I, I had the same discussion with them, right? So how are they going to personalize the relationship with me, right? And it's all about the personalization, not just delivering a service, because my benchmark becomes the last excellent service I got. It doesn't go below that, right? And that's what's not only happening with you, but it's happening with everyone. But the other thing that pandemic has introduced for us is, is the hybrid workforce. Like every organization right now has a hybrid workforce in a sense of not everyone is working in the same place as we used to be. Like mm. at least like a big portion right now of our teams, and I think it's gonna continue for a while, we're gonna have people working remotely, virtually. So the adoption of a virtual collaboration what it comes with its own risks and its own security requirements and so on, it becomes an essential element that we have to take care of. And coming to that, of course, the security, right? Because yeah. if everything becomes digital, that we have to rely on an end-to-end -end security, not just uh, one point of security, but really end-to-end -end for the whole journey. And it comes with it as well, especially in the financial sector, the fraud and how can we uh, manage against fraud because a lot of the requirements right now that is happening in real-time payments and real-time transactions that needs fraud detection and dealing with it. Only between security and fraud, that costs a lot of money and can cost a lot of uh, penalties for the organization. We did a study that we globally, there is an average between 3.6 to $3.8 million, the cost of a one breach. One data breach can cost an organization up to an average $3.8 million. And you'll be surprised, but it takes up to 280 days to get it resolved. So the question is, how can we minimize that amount? Because guess what? We're not going to be able to get rid of all of our uh, security issues, but at least how can we manage it faster? And then last but not least, but of course, cost, right? How can we try to deliver those amazing experiences and take into consideration the cost? Because I think Rajas has mentioned rightfully, Nowadays, especially after the pandemic, there has been lower revenues, there has been more pressure on uh, profits and so on. So cost becomes a huge element when we take into consideration when we go into a digital journey or a hybrid cloud journey. Um, so that summarizes more or less the main elements that we have to take care of. Uh, and I'll be more interested to hear from my esteemed colleagues as well. What is their point of view on it? We will. I mean, obviously, security and fraud are, are huge. That not one day passes without some big company. It's, it's sometimes the big tech companies are actually even uh, more uh, vulnerable to uh, breaches. Let me let me go to Mark uh, briefly. You've you've also amassed a long uh, experience in this field, specifically in these topics that we're discussing right now: finance and banking and technology. Um, the 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 advancement and the growth of virtual banking. Um, is, is evolving daily. So how has maybe integrating your experience uh, and expertise in the field and solutions helped banks in offering customers um, easy to use payment solutions? Hi, Jesse, um, everyone, thanks. Um, yes, um, I've been in banking now for over 30 years and the evolution of moving from classic bank manager, bricks and mortar, to basically having your mobile bank in your pocket through your mobile phone, you know, has been hugely impactful to society. And to the extent today that I, I see banks now, not struggling, but it's challenged with the fact that the current account uh, is becoming more of a commodity rather than the crown jewel that it was many, many years ago. Um, and therefore, as you see that, to your point about the evolution of virtual banking, the thing that becomes really important, building on um, Mustafa's point, is customer expectation. You expect 
to be able to transact, to do things anywhere. You expect to go into your supermarket, to your telecom provider, online, you know, whatever you want to do, Amazon, etc., and be able to transact with ease. Um, and one of the things that we are doing in Network International to try to enable that is, you know, we look at the customer trends and we look at, in particular, the movement of people in geographies as well, because you need to understand people's behaviour and the types of payment methods they use. Rupee, for example, in India, Terapy, MIR in Russia, mobile wallets with STC in Saudi Arabia, um, STC recently in the last few years coming from zero, um, STC, pay, uh, STC, STC Saudi Telecom as a telecoms company, evolving a fintech, STC pay, having a captive of 6 million mobile phone users, all of a sudden now using their payment platform to interact, do person-to-person -person payments, um, and even make payments at point of sale. So from our perspective, the really important, or one of the many important aspects is enabling the consumer to transact. And that's where you need to get really smart with how you adopt the different schemes, how you enable different wallets at point of sale. Um, and I think ultimately how you move beyond that cash towards cashless society that's now clearly been accelerated by the pandemic and COVID. All right, Mark, you've, um, I'm going to take that to part because um, Mark spoke a lot about or focused about customer expectations. Yes, customers now expect to do their transactions almost wherever they are and, and they expect not to hear that horrid phrase which is please visit your branch to do this and that service. So um, with this expectation and, and you yourself, Bart, as a chief and data analytics officer, how important was it to integrate and incorporate AI and cloud and data analytics to help meet these customers evolving expectations? And what are the parameters maybe to measure success? Thanks, Jesse, um, and, and first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, and I'm in this unique position, having heard to all of the previous participants of the panel. I almost want to jump in and, and start uh, commenting on the on the answers they provided. Uh, but I just to answer your question first, I think it's it's extremely important. And to start with the fintechs and third party vendors, we use the professional companies that help us provide the commercial data analytics insight for businesses. It's essential for us to to provide um ourselves with the with the in, with the information and personalization that that Mustafa has referenced so personalization or segmentation depending on whether you look at retail customers or commercial customers is something that is going to be key and essential going forward so you have to come up with a solution with a product that will meet the customer uh, the customer need. And to Mark's point, exactly, you have to look at their behaviors and then tailor what is going to work for them based on the pattern or based on similar customers that they are, they are working with. Um, you also asked about cloud, and I guess um, it's, it's extremely important to have the right infrastructure uh, to be modern, capable of processing this big data. And, and that's something that also must have a reference. So you have to be able to uh, have a place to store it, you have to be able to process it, and you have to make it secure. So um, things like fraud, which, which again was something that was mentioned before, will be um, probably one of the essential key focus areas for not only banks, but a, but a number of other institutions going forward. Um, and uh, just, just to conclude in terms of the parameters, um, I think there are, these, are, these are quite simple because first of all, you measure it by, by the revenue, you measure it by the customer satisfaction, you, you measure it by the conversion rates, uh, by, by how people react to it. And if you seem to be on the right path in terms of those KPIs, it means that you're doing a couple of things right over there for the customers. If you keep attracting new customers, again, that's an indication for you. Yes, you are probably uh, on, the, on the right path there. Okay, makes sense. I know you said you had some comments about uh, what we discussed so far. Uh, go ahead. Was there a specific point you wanted to comment? 
I did couple of, I did comment on a couple of those. So so from Mustafa and Mark, but I guess another one that Sanjay raised and is extremely important is Norblock. And Norblock is a solution that is existing at the moment um, and created together with a central bank, which allows a number of banks to pull out the information um, for customers. So whenever you come to a bank A or a bank B to open an account, they already have the data about you. So they have the basic information. You don't have to go through the tedious process of providing them the, the information. I, I believe that's the first step of increasing the customer satisfaction. And the, the end step of this for me is when you open the app with the banking, the app should already know what is it that you want to do uh, as, as a banking customer. Okay, I'm going to go back to Sanjay, please. We, we, we heard a lot and we will continue to hear about security and safety and data privacy. You're the CEO of one of the leading banks right now in UAE. How would you say you have enhanced your security environment and network availability to appease the concerns, uh, the privacy and security concerns of customers? First of all, security in the current way, the uh, threats are uh, arising each day is a continuous evolving process. It's not that one day you implement something and they forget about it. It's not going yeah. to work like that. So you have to constantly look, keep looking at all your security uh, parameters, whether it is a network, uh, whether it's a parameter level security, whether it's a network level security, whether it's user endpoint security or uh, application and data security. So you have a number of... Uh, options that you can uh, keep uh, improving over there. For example, in the parameter security, you will have the firewalls of the world implemented over there. You'll create DMZs and all those things in the uh, parameter security. Well, when you look at the network security, you, uh, you will basically put uh, softwares like NAC to basically ensure that no one else can connect on your network. Only an authorized person is able to connect on your network. Or you will basically do network level of segregations among your various applications. So you define your application as critical or non-critical and keep segregating them into various layers depending on the data that is at those applications are handling. Or at, at the endpoint level, basically you will probably do some kind of an uh, what do you say, uh, endpoint uh, detection uh, software you'll put over there so that if there is any anomaly detected any at any endpoint, that is at a user desktop or anything, that immediately alerts us and tells us there's something ha happening over there and we can immediately take that uh, network device, uh, that device out of our uh, network and mm -hmm. then isolate it and address it. So the, these are the various things that we also, uh, like any other company, have implemented over there. Besides that, now going forward on the cloud also, we are basically taking a similar approach uh, on the public cloud also, we are implementing a similar kind of, uh, uh, basically the security uh, implementation is almost similar to what we have put in our data center. Right, so Rajesh, we've heard a lot now about precautions um, that could be taken to avoid any uh, pitfalls. Okay, so the question to you now, you know, in case a pitfall, does happen and it will happen. It, it, at the end of the day, we're dealing with new systems and new new ideas. Nothing is foolproof, I, I, I believe. How do you think banks can effectively maybe develop strategy to maneuver any uh, pitfall in their services through AI um, and at the same time, also enhance their competitiveness within the sector? I think two aspects. One, I think uh, AI use cases are relevant to every industry sector and so is the DevOps, irrespective of the industry vertical that you look at. I think Sanjay touched upon one of the aspects was around the security. I think security teams are overwhelmed by the number of the alerts and the inputs they are getting from system, whether these are in-premise or on the hybrid cloud deployments. And uh, security is uh, absolutely paramount to any reputation of any organization. So AI has got some phenomenal use cases around the security. And I believe, I think every organization can make uh, some phenomenal uh, use of uh, AI, whether it is for a, whether it is for taking care of the cyber security threats, or also maybe also helping them in terms of a better understanding of the customers, help them in terms of the advisory function. So if you look at some of the new business models like Betterment, there are companies who are taking the, most of these advisory services of the bank, which are purely on a fee or a commission basis, and using AI to advise the customer in terms of the investment portfolios, understanding their risk profiles. So, so the use cases are immense. On, on the DevOps side, if you look at, I think typically if you look at today, consumers are looking at fast response from the from 
from uh, banks. They're looking at systems which can integrate end-to-end -end the onboarding digital uh, effectiveness of the channels. So, and, and traditionally the bank systems or the financial services systems are not uh, tuned up for handling uh, these kind of new requirements. So DevOps would help the banks in terms of modernizing their applications, making sure that the team uh, works phenomenally well in terms of understanding how the application needs to be uh, taken care of, both from a modernization perspective, its effectiveness, how AI automation can be infused right from the beginning, security aspects can be taken care of, while the application development is in, in process before it really goes for a large scale deployments. So I think uh, the, these are the two uh, key dimensions, whether it is around AI or the DevOps, both in terms of uh, looking at the, at the larger aspect of the customer, which are digitally native. And from an AI perspective, I think uh, building uh, more process automation, building uh, more intelligence out of the system for all the, all the data that the banks or any, any industry collects, how to make a more intelligent insight out of uh, and use it to the advantage of the, of the organization, whether it is in terms of customer satisfaction or in terms of bringing new products and offerings. Okay, I see Mustafa, uh, you're, you're nodding your head in approval uh, in most of what uh, Rajesh just mentioned. You're, you're the VP of Cloud and Cognitive Software. Again, you're at the crux of, of this phase that we are in. I don't want to ask, keep asking you very broad questions, you know, like how has the financial sector achieved efficiency? But I would like to hear from you a specific case. No need to mention any names, but I'd like to get more of a tangible example of a certain institution, of a certain bank, of a certain financial uh, uh, institution that has leveraged and achieved operational efficiencies through cloud. Can you, can you give us sort of a mini case study? Um, but let me start by, by where do we stand today? Because I think as Rajesh said, um, that's why I was like, again, what he's saying, like, I believe every financial institution has started their journey for digitization, right? Yeah. So even the examples that we're gonna share right now is just few examples, but I believe it's already started everywhere. But yet only three to 4% of any financial service organization workload has moved to a public cloud. And that has a reason, right? Uh, the reason is mainly, there are, of course there are many, but the main one is financial sector is a very highly regulated industry, right? There's a lot of regulators requirement. There is a lot of uh, uh, restrictions that we have to take care of in terms of data privacy, in terms of performing specific transactions, in terms of reporting, in terms of uh, uh, linking with other organizations. So it's a very regulated environment. And therefore, there was one of two solutions. Either we bring the regulations to a public cloud, and this is what IBM did, and we launched recently the first financial sector public cloud that actually incorporate uh, the financial regulations and frameworks on the public cloud. So whenever we need some services to be on a public cloud, then at least the financial in, uh, institution have the, 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 the comfort that it is following their regulations and their, uh, the, the frameworks that they're using. But at the same time, the majority of the workload will remain on-prem, will remain in our data centers, right? So the real solution in our opinion is really the hybrid cloud, right? How to leverage both sides. How can we leverage based on our use cases? And let me give you the examples like in one of the leading uh, banks in the UAE, um, we have been working with them on a digital transformation journey where we are leveraging a hybrid cloud environment in order to automate and digitize their processes by which they're serving their customers. Uh, basically, we, we are taking uh, around 20 processes, like this is the first batch, and we're doing a whole automation for it. It's an end-to-end -end smart automation to simplify the customer experience and to make it uh, a bit more um, uh, different, a little bit more personalized, let's put it this way. And mm. things like loan origination, things like opening a bank account, um, like uh, things related to claims and so on. How can I really like, if I'm sitting on my phone, I can do all my, uh, all these transactions and all these uh, processes in a very easy way without have to deal with a lot of, uh, uh, human interactions because I'm gonna wanna do it at 4 a.m. in the morning, right? Uh, another example in Turkey with one of the insurance companies, 
where we help them automate their processes, basically their journey, client journey from opening uh, a new policy with them to the claim side, right? Not only that, but really integrating the insurance company with the hospitals that are, they're that working with, their ecosystem that are working with. So here we're getting into a hybrid cloud version that is beyond one organization, right? And how can we, we, we actually, we, we reach a point where if I take, for example, opening a new policy, it, now it can be done in 10 to 12 seconds, right? Instead of like being done in days uh, using the, 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 our cloud packs and using our technology. Uh, another example, which is a different one in Ghana, where we went completely on a, um, uh, an open bank, completely on a public cloud, right? And um, uh, we had this uh, full journey, full interaction with the, with the bank in Ghana. It's actually, it's a new bank. It's a new, basically it's an app, it's a fintech. It's not even a bank, right? Let's put it in the right way. It's just a fintech. And a third, and a, the last example I want to give was in Pakistan, where working really with the uh, one link in Pakistan, which is a backbone of all the transactions that is happening between linking the banks, linking the ATMs, linking the utility payment, uh, linking, uh, it's a basically a gateway that helps all the different financial institutions in Pakistan linking together and provide their services. And of course, at the other end, linking to Visa and MasterCard and GSP and, and so on, how can they put the right uh, uh, APIs and the right, basically adopting the open banking standards in order to provide a platform where a person can do the transaction regardless where I'm gonna do it. I wanna do it with this bank, with this service. It's, it's having this kind of inter, uh, inter, uh, interaction and integration between the different organizations. So those are very quick examples I wanted to share. And there is many more, as I said, we, it, everyone has started. No, it's fantastic. It's definitely a huge operation and there's so much opportunity, as you just mentioned, to integrate different services uh, and bring them together uh, with ease in one place. I mean, I mean, look, and customers like me, I still get excited because I just renewed my car license, uh, my car plates all on my phone. And, and that, that, got, that was the highlight of my month. I received my car plates. I didn't have to move from the house. So let alone small companies or big companies who are able to uh, simplify this. I'd like to go to, um, to continue this point with Mark and focus on digital wallets maybe since we're discussing this um, increase in demand of, of finishing a payment or, or a process from the comfort of your home or your phone. How have digital wallets and P2P payments and virtual cards, um, uh, how adaptive have they become, uh, especially here in this region? Are we still in the first phase of this journey? So, um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, the, the propensity for wallets um, is everywhere. Um, the challenge is, um, I think for many, um, is it who, who are going to be the winners in the wallets? And I think the answer is, it really depends on who they are. I mentioned STCP. If you talk about banks versus mobile money versus technology companies, even the banks now are virtualizing their cards the minute you open a current account. So you can immediately use your card on e-commerce or use it in the mobile app. So I think it's it, it, the lifespan of cards. I think the physical card um, is going to be much shorter um, post COVID. Um, I think all payments are definitely on the trajectory for coming from mobile, which really drives, I think, um, most of his earlier point, uh, and I think um, Sanjay mentioned it. When you think about the security and the concerns um, about payments, tokenization then starts to bring that level of certainty and comfort to be able to really run all your finances from your mobile in your pocket. Um, and naturally, the mobile phone itself basically becomes your bank and the wallet. So ultimately, you know, and that's also a disaster, by the way, <laughs> for women. Any, well, it's, 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 it's certainly a disaster for my wife. My wife loses her phone 25 times a day. So it's, um, it, it's, it, it's it, she loses her card less. So it, indeed, it's pretty stressful. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's an inevitability. And I think, 
um, you know, really majoring on the whole point of um, virtual cards and banking and wallets. Um, we've kind of been doing it since Apple Pay um, in some respects. What COVID um, has enabled, and you've probably seen this, is the limits have increased on touch and go on a lot of the point of sale and the physical aspects. I think that's just a thematic um, with the advent of tokenization that will be completely removed. I, don't, I see limits on the mobile to the touch being completely um, eradicated in the very near future as, as the cashless society really starts to take hold. Great. I, I'm going to take this uh, notion to Bart as well. We continue talking about cashless societies, uh, Bart. What is the role of data in a seamless, maybe, uh, transition? I don't even know if a seamless transition to digital cashless experience uh, is a accurate term. Uh, but, and also, what are the major learnings, maybe, while implementing this attempt of a seamless transition? Right. Um, I, I think you're right, by the way, to, to start with, with the fact that it's not going to be a seamless transition. Yeah. It's going to, uh, there's going to be some bumps on the way. Um, but I think to start with the, the we gain a much richer um, data set of information with the cashless society. We get different dimensions, different information about the spending, purpose of transactions, or details that can help us identify what actually drives an individual or a company. So we have to look at a couple of like, what? What are the details of those transactions? Why don't they do it with cash? When? When do they do it? What time of a day they need a particular service? Why? Why do they do it? What's their need? What's really driving their their need to spend money? And um, and the the data's role is to figure out how to actually use it, how to do it, and how to make it easier for for the customers. Um, and in terms of the learnings, I guess there are two probably I would mention or highlight. Um, the first one is the data privacy, and we have seen many times when personal information or sensitive information was misused by the companies. So there have to be really clear guidelines about what companies can and cannot do with the information that we provide them with. Um, and the second one, um, I guess the cashless society needs to be be regulated to an extent. Um, so that's why I'm mentioning it's not going to be a seamless one. Uh, because to take an example of digital currencies, uh, which are a fantastic thing, and it's great that they they, they now exist in the, in the financial world, but we need to know how are they being used and by whom and for what purpose. So whenever we have that clarity, and it's not being used to avoid paying taxes, or it's not being used to, to conceal some funds, I think that's where we get to a stage where this transition from cash really does make sense. And it benefits everyone, not just a small portion of people around the globe, if that makes sense. And I'm happy to open a debate if anyone has a different view on the on the panel. I doubt everybody is shaking their heads and Zafir is smiling. So I'm, <laughs> unless anybody wants to challenge that notion, I'm going to take it to Sanjay because I believe uh, your bank was one of the first to incorporate uh, fintech and drive innovation uh, here in UAE. So can you? Can we touch a little bit more on how you use the fintech platform to enhance your offerings specifically to the small and, and medium enterprise clients and how maybe it has opened opportunities uh, to them? If you have any specific case, we'd love to hear more examples like we just heard from Mustafa. Basically, you see, our bank, like I just said earlier, also has been at the forefront of using the new technologies that are coming around, whether it's blockchain, whether it's API, cloud, whichever you name. So wherever we can see there is a value that can be driven to generate more revenue for the bank, we basically leverage those technologies over here. With, especially with fintechs, uh, uh, basically we have used the uh, open API platform of ours, uh, basically and opened up our banking services to, uh, for use with this fintechs. Uh, for a use case perspective, from the SME perspective, especially we there is a, uh, a fintech called Versify, which provides uh, Accounting, uh, accounting software on the cloud to many of these uh, SMEs in this country over here. So we have tied up with them and using the same accounting uh, software, their clients can do the rag, uh, rag bank, uh, uh, what do you say, rag bank clients who are using their platform can basically do the banking services straight from their platform. They don't need to come separately and log into my digital banking platform. They can do it directly from the sitting in from that particular Versify platform. 
whether they want to look at our account balance or they want to print a statement or do any transaction, they can do it from the Versify platform itself without getting out of the platform. Similarly, we have uh, done something with the, another uh, uh, fintech called Eden Red over here, which services a blue collared workers for almost uh, a million blue collared workers in the UAE. And uh, we have we had tied up with them to do the uh, salary processing for them. But also what we did with them is they have their own mobile platform which these blue collared workers use to look at the salary, getting credited and all those things. But in that we built into, uh, through our using an open API platform, we built in the money transfer services. So now all these blue collared workers without leave, uh, they, they don't need to go only on Fridays to the, Dera Souk or to the Bajuma or to the Burdubai over there to do their uh, money transfers to their locations, either in India, Pakistan, and Philippines, wherever they keep doing it. They can do it at their convenience from there using this app to any uh, any of this lo location and instantly. It goes, the money transfer happens instantly over here. In fact, uh, this health bank uh, built the whole money transfer business where the, around three years back, the bank was not. Uh, a major player into the money transfer business. And today, the bank does uh, almost uh, around 1.5 billion in money transfer using these platforms, just creating another revenue stream, a fees-based revenue stream for the bank. Uh, recently, you would have heard of another one, uh, FinTech called Yap, who's again using our platform to provide uh, banking services to their customers. So whether they are doing some virtual prepaid cards or something, they are basically using the backend platform as the uh, rag bank platform over there. So okay, let, let me go to Mustafa with that. Um, Mustafa, uh, banks have been again on the forefront of this transformation. Um, give us maybe your overview on how they have progressed so far compared to other sectors, because other sectors are either leading ahead, especially healthcare, or lagging behind. And do you think, what do you think we should be um, looking for in the future, specifically in the financial sector? Uh, very good question, because I believe the financial sector and the banking sector in specific is one of the oldest industries, right? And that brings a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. <clears throat> of course, the challenge that we have is there has been a lot of investment in legacy uh, applications and technologies and so many of it that actually constitute the services that any bank or any financial institution is providing right now. Uh, but there is a big opportunity because once again, they hold an amount of data that I don't think anyone and anyone else has, right? So those are two balanced uh, things that I see. But having said that, uh, there has been a lot of pockets and a lot of uh, implementations that I've seen across the board. Uh, I think the foundation is there in terms of a real digital transformation. Most of the banks right now that have their own multi-channel banking, uh, they have their own um, uh, even um, uh, uh, virtual assistant platforms uh, that have their customers. Um, they have their own cybersecurity uh, solutions, but I still see it as a pocket. I still believe we're still, there's a lot more to be done, especially in the financial sector. And especially on I mean, four fronts. Um, let me say, especially sure. the virtual assistants. I mean, they need yes. assistants. <laughs> virtual assistants need help. <laughs> I mean, I have not been able to complete one transaction uh, with a virtual assistant. I ninety percent uh, of the time I request a physical human to talk to an agent. Absolutely yes, because there is a difference between uh, a conversational engine, what I can talk to. <laughs> And a really virtual assistant who can perform, it's like who, but who it can be perform a real transaction or a real yeah. service to me, right? Yeah. And yeah. that two different com but complementing uh, uh, components of, a, of a, a virtual assistant. And this is yeah. why I'm saying there is pockets and there's a good start, but there's still a lot of room. And to bring to this point, uh, Jesse, is yes, there has to be more leverage. Why a virtual assistant does not deliver all our services? Because they're still not leveraging all the right data in a secure and a very uh, a private that follows the regulations, follows the framework that we're using in the most optimum way, right? And that needs good integration, good mm -hmm. like automation, right? A lot of process has to be automated for a virtual assistant 
to be able to deliver the service for us, yeah. right? And security, right? Security is a key and not just a pin or a product security, as I mentioned before, but really looking at what we call um, a zero trust security framework that, that takes the whole journey from since I start connecting to do a service until everything gets done, how can I make sure that the end-to-end -end security journey is being taken care of, not just from an end user perspective, but even when it comes to fraud, when it comes locally to the bank, uh, taking care of, if there's an incident happen, how can I manage the whole situation, right? It is a journey. I think San Sanjay and Mark have mentioned it. It is really a journey even when it comes to security, right? And we have to have a holistic view of how we're tackling our security. The last one that I wanted to mention is really the adoption of open banking, because we believe that's, that's gonna be really a future of integrating not only our own processes, but integrating the different financial organizations together. And this is why in IBM, we, we invested a lot in open banking and we became one of the leaders globally when it comes to the contribution that we're doing in open banking. And we have our own references as well. Like I mentioned, like the one link in Pakistan as one example. But that's, I believe, that's going to be a major um, uh, shift and, and, and a major adoption in most of the banks. I think Sanjay has mentioned um, uh, RAC is one of the uh, banks in the UE who is using or his, they're adopting the open banking as well. And I think there will be more and more happening. It's all about automation, modernization, modernization of their processes. It's about really leveraging the data and leveraging AI, not just in conversational, but in really developing services and performing services and in open banking and integration beyond the financial sector or beyond, sorry, one sector or one organization in specific. Great, I mean, um, I know we're getting close to the end of this webinar. We're, we're almost out of time. So I'm gonna split the last uh, few minutes between Mark and Bart, unless somebody wants to object, but why would you object? So let me go to Mark briefly. Um, I know we agreed that there's no such thing as a seamless uh, transformation, but what would you say are the top uh, necessities, uh, tools, services that should be there to ensure a FinTech platform that is as seamless as possible and as safe and secure uh, as possible? And, and what more strides do you, would you say you're making to empower the business? So, I mean, I think the, um, my colleagues have mentioned this or, or talked around it earlier. Um, but for me, the, the whole idea of, let's use seamless, I'm not a fan of the word, but we'll use seamless. Yeah, I agree. We'll talk I about, lack of better we'll talk about, <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, seamless time to market, um, yeah. integration, these have always been the, some of the core desires from technology companies to provide capabilities for customers. For me, the, the straightforward response is this. Partnership is the new competency. If you want to be successful in the financial services, partnership and the ability to partner um, and whether you're co-sharing, VCing, whatever it happens to be, but partnership as a competency it needs to be built out extensively. Underpinning that, if you talk about the, the core technology aspects, of course, having an API platform is critical and having that in a standard and um, consumable fashion with a catalog of services and capabilities. For me, those two things go hand in hand as part of your ability to provide a better customer experience and faster response to market trends and to uh, Mustafa's starting point of the, the session, customer expectation. Um, and we're actively doing that in NI, um, having recently hired a very senior person from the market to focus on fintech partnerships and solutions and that level of partnership integration. I think the days are gone whereby you need to build it all yourself. Um, that is a very much a legacy and um, very cumbersome and slow model that ultimately it's just not sustainable. It doesn't match any customer expectation. Um, let's be honest. Yes, there's certainly a gap uh, that needs to be bridged, especially specifically with customers' expectations. I'd like to go to HSBC with Bart um, and maybe ask you briefly also what 
have you been doing differently uh, than other banks uh, at, when it comes to digitization and maybe quickly what your plans are to bring innovation to your services? Right. So before that, I guess it's important to comment that I think, I mean, I'm sure we, um, I know already we are doing majority of what was mentioned already by yeah. the other panelists and uh, we're participating in a number of uh, innovative uh, solutions that are on, in the market, except probably for the faulty virtual assistants. We, we don't do those. Uh, but what we are doing different is um, I believe that we, we have a different approach, first of all, uh, than the other banks. And to Mark's point, we believe in the partnership. Um, and based on the patterns, data segmentation, we genuinely offer our customers what we think will benefit them. So the motivation there is to make sure they're happy about what they're receiving from us. It's not how much of the revenue that's going to generate. It's of course there, but it's not the primary primary um, target. And I think that's very visible by how our relationship managers approach the customers and speak to them. And I have, um, I guess, two examples to provide with this. So for the existing customers, we offer cross-selling opportunities. And in one of the projects, we identified a number of customers where we could elevate them from a lower tier to a higher tier by providing them other products that they have not been using, but were used by a higher tier customers. And that benefit our customers uh, significantly. Um, in terms of new to bank customers, I guess um, the, the, the whole world is talking about the climate change and carbon free economy. As far as I know, uh, and that's just one of the examples that I could provide, we are the only one, the only bank in the region that has a proposition for such customers. Mm -hmm. And based on our data, we know who those customers uh, that resonate with these kind of values would be. So that makes sense. Again, the focus, the big focus in all this. Uh, phase we are on is the customer is a, an experience as easy uh, and maybe as fast as possible. Uh, some institutions talk about few seconds transactions, others longer, of course, we're going to have different results. If I were to sum up all of your um, wonderful insights, some interesting numbers came out of this webinar uh, uh, from IBM specifically, a data breach, the average cost of a data breach is uh, 3.8 million dollars and almost takes 280 days to fix. Here's the importance on focusing on security when you're moving to any uh, data solution or any uh, iCloud or hybrid uh, cloud solution. Uh, of course, the focus again on the need to be faster, safer, bigger, better uh, is only on the rise and it's going to continue to do so. The importance here, apart from fixing the customer expectations or attempting to reach uh, the customer expectation is also to uh, manage it. And um, another number that also caught my attention is uh, also from IBM, only 3% now of institutions are on public uh, cloud. So the solution here is to uh, integrate. Um, and there's a lot of solutions that uh, have been offered from uh, GBM and uh, IBM. Uh, of course, you spoke also about automation, the importance of AI and the crucial uh, need for uh, open banking and integration, not only uh, within the financial sector. I'd like to thank all of you for such uh, immense insight on this um, uh, digital age and the digital boom within the uh, financial sector. I'd like to uh, thank you for watching and our partner GBM for this wonderful webinar and see you in the next session. Have a great day. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you Bart. Thank you, Sanjay. And thank you, Forbes team. Thank you, Mustafa, uh, for giving your uh, valuable insight and sharing your point of view on the industry. And uh, looking forward to cooperate with you guys moving forward. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Jesse, for having us here.